This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Brought to you in part by... TheStreet.com, featuring Stephanie Link, who shares her investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights with Action Alerts Plus, the multi-million dollar portfolio she manages with Jim Cramer. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Going, going, gone. 2014's gains erased. The Dow turns negative for the year. The Nasdaq drops triple digits and the S&P 500 logs its worst week in two years. What's the best way to protect your portfolio now? Searching for stability in this uncertain market. Our market monitor guest says he has a list of stocks that can help you find it. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday. October 10. Good evening, everyone. Another brutal day of selling on Wall Street. Not only did the Dow turn negative for the year and suffer its third triple-digit loss of this week, the Nasdaq also had a rare triple-digit decline. The main culprit here, semiconductor stocks. Microchip technology tumbled the most in almost six years after the company warned of a possible correction in the industry triggering a sell-off in other chip names like Freescale, Intel, and Texas Instruments. Stocks sold off into the closing bell after another up-and-down session. The Dow lost 115 points. The Nasdaq tumbled 102 points, posting its first back-to-back 2% declines in three years. And the S&P down 22 points. So far this month, the Dow has moved more than 2,000 points, and that's just in the last eight trading days. And for the week, the major averages each ended lower the third week in a row. The Dow down nearly 3 percent, the Nasdaq off by 4.5 percent, and the S&P slipped more than 3 percent. So what should investors like you do to protect your portfolio in these volatile markets? Sharon Epperson has some advice from the experts. Hi, Sharon. Well, hi, Tyler. It's certainly been a rough week for many investors, but there are some defensive moves that you can take to protect your portfolio. Start by reviewing your time horizon and risk profile. Short-term investors may find themselves out of luck in a volatile market, but taking a longer-term view, the stock market's recovery over the past five years has seen a 70 to 80 percent return in many portfolios. This week's 2 to 3 percent loss is small in comparison. And if you're a long-term investor, financial advisors agree that it's important not to panic, even if there's a broader correction. That said, now may be a good time to sell your big winners and lock in some gains. You can reinvest the proceeds in more conservative investments. Another option is to use a stop-loss order to protect gains and minimize losses. That's in order to sell a stock that is triggered when the share price reaches a certain level. And finally, you may want to consider your asset allocation and ensure that it's balanced, including not just stocks and bonds that suit your risk profile, but also alternative investments, such as managed futures or long short funds, which can reduce volatility in the portfolio while delivering solid returns. Now, every investor should keep in mind that the stock market often experiences at least one pullback a year, but pullbacks always do come to an end. Oh, well, that's a really good point. Yeah. Sharon, stay uh, with us, and let's sure. bring in Ron Carson. He manages portfolios totaling more than $4 billion at his firm, Carson Wealth Management, where he is the founder and CEO. Ron, welcome to the program. Let me just pick up on something that oh, Sharon... thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Sharon uh, just said a moment ago, and I think this is something that people lose sight of, that over the last five years, the S&P turned around 80% uh, after a big correction. Is it sometimes better to do nothing and just ride it out, or should you really be making changes in your portfolio? What are your thoughts, and what are you telling your clients? Well, I think it makes sense most of the time to do nothing. I mean, we had a 7% drawdown in January. Uh, April, we had four. August, we had four. I think we're down five and a half, maybe 6% on this current sell-off. And most of the time, you know, the market tends to do whatever it needs, needs to do to prove the largest number of people wrong in any given moment. And a lot has not changed, and I certainly wouldn't panic. Uh, investor behavior is the most important factor in how someone's going to do long-term. So if you have an appropriate allocation, then I would not do anything. I, I gather you're basically saying that more investors hurt themselves more by doing something than by doing nothing, right? Yes. I mean, this is a hated bull market, mm -hmm. really, when you think about off the lows of January, because most people haven't entered it. You know, the retail investors just started to tiptoe back. There's still a lot of worry out there. And, you know, there's some other factors going but on. But 
Um, you know, my friend Bob but, Dahl said he thinks we're eight to ten year bull market. I don't know if we have that long left, but I but I don't think this is anything. But to worry what about, about Sharon's point? I'm sorry to interrupt uh, about taking profits on some of your big win. Nobody ever lost money taking profits, Ron. I agree that you do pay tax on taking profits and. All the studies I've seen, and I see it firsthand, that people that make short-term reactions, they take profits, typically those positions are higher. Now, we have trim positions. Uh, we do, you know, the dollar was up in the third quarter versus a euro 8%. We think that's going to continue. So if you're owning big multinationals that are getting at least 40 to 50% of their earnings overseas, I think that's going to be a headwind. We've definitely trimmed profits in those areas. I mean, now is just a good time, I think, guys, for people to use this as a wake-up call. If you are at all worried about what you've seen in the volatility that you've seen in the market, just take the time to assess where you are. Make sure that you can tolerate this kind of correction if it's even if there is a broader correction and make sure that what you've allocated because you probably have seen some really big gains is what your allocation should be so if you were going to be 60 40 stocks and bonds and now you're 70 30 you do need to do what Ron said and trim some of those profits and and reallocate so that you're invested properly let me ask you this and then we'll also ask Ron too you said don't panic I mean obviously take the emotion out of this but what is the most common mistake that people make in these volatile trading sessions I think it is just being emotional and saying, you know, looking at a statement and saying this went down this much now I want to just get me out of it. Rather than realizing that you're in these positions whether it's Europe, whether it's large cap multinational companies for a reason and if it's the reason is to get to a certain financial goal, you need to stay there if you want to reach that goal. And Ron, what do you think? Is is you agree with what Sharon's saying or is there something else? I really agree with what she says. I think a lot of people invest. I mean, people spend more time picking out a car than they will financial <laughs> advice or any even investment they're gonna make. And you really need to understand what you own. Volatility will either be a curse or a gift. If, if, you, if you really understand why you own, what you own, how it fits into your long-term objectives, this is a gift that you can add to high-quality companies. If you're guessing, you're gonna panic and you're gonna destroy long-term value in your portfolio. Is it too late to hedge now, Ron? And give me a very quick answer. Uh, what's the best way to hedge? We believe in irreplaceable capital strategies. You hedge with using uh, some of the derivatives. You need to understand how much you can afford to lose and hedge the rest of it out of the market. All right, Ron. And it's not too late. All right, thanks, Ron and Sharon, both of you. Have a great weekend. Ron Carson with Carson Wealth Management. And Sharon's going to be back a little later in the program with a look at millennials and their money and why this demographic is actually better off financially than you might think. Oil prices stopped their recent slide today, but just barely, after news that OPEC's oil supply last month was the highest in more than a year, with top producer Saudi Arabia raising production in September. Domestic crude closed five cents a barrel higher today after being down as much as a buck and a half early in the session. Uh, Brent crude, the international variety, touched a four-year low before rising late in the day and closing above $90 a barrel. With oil prices down more than $20 a barrel just since the end of June, what's the impact of lower energy costs on the U.S. economy and for consumers? Steve Leisman takes a look. Lower gas prices are arriving for consumers at just the right time. As Americans start thinking about holiday spending, they'll get a welcome gift at the pump as gas prices head down towards the $3 a gallon level. The gas that my car uses premium gas, so I see a big difference in the price of gas. The general rule, every $10 a barrel of decline in the price of oil adds a quarter point to growth. Bring that down to the consumer level, and Deloitte retail analyst Allison Paul says the recent trend, if it continues, could put about $260 in the pocket of the average consumer. Typically, Steve, lower gas prices are good for the U.S. economy. When you have a drop in gas prices, consumers see more disposable income. Uh, they can spend things on things other than filling up their car, uh, and that usually supports overall levels of growth. One thing economists look at, why are oil prices falling? If they're down because demand is lower, that could signal weaker growth ahead. But the U.S. Energy Information Administration sees demand growing by about 2.2 million barrels this year and next. But mostly because of growth in North American production, supply is forecast to rise by 2.5 million barrels. So the price decline looks more about extra supply than it does weak demand. While the vast majority of U.S. consumers will benefit from lower oil prices, now that the U.S. has become such a major oil producer, there's a potential downside if prices get too low. 
Over the past 10 years, the oil and gas industry has grown at twice the rate of the overall economy, and some boom towns have cropped up that benefit from the production. But experts say the price has to fall further, below $70 a barrel, to make the new U.S. production unprofitable. So for now, it could be the best of both worlds, lower oil prices and considerable economic growth from oil production. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. More trouble today for the struggling Eurozone economies. The S&P rating service lowered its outlook for France from stable to negative today, saying a robust recovery in the French economy could prove elusive and that its public finances could deteriorate beyond this year. S&P did affirm France's AA long-term credit rating. Leaders of West African nations hit hard by the Ebola outbreak have been pleading for help in dealing with the crisis. And now the World Bank is calling for the creation of an international emergency fund to quickly distribute money to countries affected by the disease outbreaks and other health emergencies. And still ahead on the program, combine casual gaming with casual dining, and you get the latest offering to hit Wall Street, Dave and Buster's. But did it score with investors? The answer coming up. There's a new stock that began trading today on the NASDAQ, Dave and Buster's. This is the restaurant and arcade chain, which uses the ticker symbol play. After pricing nearly 6 million shares at $16 a piece, shares rose 8%. Pretty impressive on a nasty day of selling for the rest of the stocks on the NASDAQ. Morgan Brennan has more on what's ahead for the company. It's a company known for skee ball, cocktails, and a mountain of nachos. And after leading the company to its IPO, Dave & Buster's CEO Stephen King says there's room for more. Comp store sales are really strong, kind of leading the uh, way in casual dining. Our margins are better. And our pipeline for new store growth at about 10% a year is, is really on track and well established. Dave & Buster's has 70 locations across the U.S. and Canada, and it breaks its business down into two parts dining, food and alcohol, and amusements, arcade games like this one that customers play for prizes. These games account for more than 50% of the company's $636 million in revenues, and it helps offset volatile commodity prices associated with restaurants, and it's much less expensive to run. Although most analysts have not yet officially begun covering the stock, many say this company will fall under casual dining, an industry that's underperformed the broader S&P 500 this year. But the amusement segment will mean comparisons to movie theater and theme park operators as well. It's not that common. Most restaurant companies are primarily serving food, and um, that's, uh, it, there's not much entertainment uh, within the restaurant space um, in terms of... Uh, dine-in and as well as entertainment. So Dave & Buster's is fairly unique from that standpoint. Even so, Dave & Buster's is going public at a rocky time for restaurant chains. El Pollo Loco and Zoe's Kitchen have doubled in value this year since their IPOs, but others like Papa Murphy's and Potbelly are trading below their initial price tags. The past four years have been very strong for restaurants, so we have seen a nice healthy IPO cycle. Um, and the IPOs that have come out, have um, they've been a mixed bag. You've had some that have performed extremely well and then some that have disappointed. This first day of trading marked the end of an era for DMB as well. The company had been taken private in 2006 to then be sold to current owner Oak Hill Capital, a private equity firm that sold none of its shares today. Oak Hill tried to take Dave & Buster's public two years ago before pulling the offering last minute, citing market conditions. Today's opening comes amid a volatile week, but for investors, Dave & Buster served up something they liked. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan in New York City. And next week, look for Fiat Chrysler to start trading on the New York Stock Exchange under the temp symbol FCA. But this listing is different. It's not considered an IPO. There will be no new stock initially offered, just shares of Fiat SPA that will be transferred from the Italian stock market. Those shares can then be traded, bought and sold in New York. 
Some analysts say the company could execute a secondary offering sometime down the road. The listing is another step in the company's five-year growth plan. Meanwhile, the expected IPO of another company has been delayed for now, Box. This cloud storage provider is officially delaying plans to go public until January, citing volatile market conditions and a fresh injection of private equity money. Activist shareholders managed to throw out the entire board at the parent company of Olive Garden. And that's where we begin our market focus for a Friday. Darden Restaurants lost a standoff with big shareholder Starboard Value at its annual meeting today, which ended with Starboard's 12-person slate getting elected to the board of directors in one fell swoop. Shares of Darden, the nation's largest operator of full-service restaurants, fell nearly 2 percent. It closed the day at $48.37. After a surprise decline in sales in China in September, its first monthly dip this year, Ford Motors predicts a big boost in sales once new Ford assembly plants come online there and some new models hit Chinese showrooms in the coming months. Ford shares, though, down a nickel apiece today. They finished at $13.79. Sticking with automobiles, Tesla unveiled a new version of its electric Model S sedan. The new model, called the D, includes all-wheel drive and dual engines. CEO Elon Musk said they've improved everything about the car, including its speed, and it has a longer range on one charge. Investors didn't care, though, hoping to see a new SUV or a lower-priced electric model. Shares fell nearly 8 percent in Tesla today. Hedge fund manager David Einhorn is pushing for big changes at Civio after disclosing an almost 10 percent stake in the company. Einhorn said he wants the CEO out and wants to convert the firm to a real estate company. Civio provides housing for workers in the Canadian oil sands and Australian natural resource sector. The company said last month it plans to move its headquarters from Dallas to Canada. Shares ended 20 cents higher, closing at $12.46. The Food and Drug Administration has approved a daily pill that can cure the most common form of hepatitis C. The once-a-day pill is the first treatment that promises to cure most patients without requiring other medications, and it builds on Gilead's blockbuster Sovaldi drug. The cost? $94,500 for a 12-week treatment, $63,000 for eight weeks. Shares of Gilead, though, fell 2 percent, ending at $103.73. And shares of Exact Sciences soared after Medicare recommended a higher-than-expected reimbursement for its colon cancer screening test. The recommendation comes as the biotech company moves to commercialize that non-invasive test. Shares shot up nearly 36 percent. Our market monitor tonight has a few stocks he says will hold up in both good times and bad times in the stock market. That sounds like a pretty good recipe tonight. He's Jim Awad, uh, chairman of Plimsoll Mark Capital. Uh, Mr. Awad, always good to see you. My I pleasure. I see that you say you're, you're, you're leaning towards large conservative stocks with low investor expectations. Trouble is, sometimes these kinds of stocks live down to those expectations. Well, that's the key. You've got to be right on the uh, fundamentals. But I think it's very important in this environment uh, to sort of lower your risk pro profile, uh, given the fact that we're at a point where the market could go either way. So, yes, you're right. Uh, sometimes they, they just keep going down. But in, in these three cases, I don't think that's going to be the case. All right, well, let's talk about them, Jim. You have IBM at the top of your list. And this is a stock that's very controversial. Investors have been so frustrated. The stock just has been going up and down and all over the place. Why are you right. recommending it now? Well, it's misperceived. Uh, the, it's, it's viewed as an, as an old line company that the world has passed by, and the bad rap is that its revenues have not been growing the last few quarters. Yet, if you really drill down on it, first of all, it's at a P.E. ratio, just a little over half of the, uh, that of the stock market. It's got a dividend yield of 2.5 percent. Their record over the last 10 years has been to grow operating earnings at about 12 percent and increase the dividend at a rate of about 13 percent. And they are, they are buying back stock, uh, increasing margins, and they're rapidly transitioning to the cloud and, and the new business lines. In fact, their cloud business has doubled since the end of 19, uh, since uh, 2012. So I think you're in a situation where you'll start to see the revenues accelerate along with the earnings. So when you see those kinds of numbers that you describe, it's got to be misperception there, because if you're growing earnings and you're growing the dividend, you ought to see some payoff for that. Let's move to another one that has really been becalmed over the past decade, and that's General Electric. Yeah. Now, there's a stock that's down 9 percent this year versus a 4 percent increase in the S&P. And I think it's just misunderstood because it's very complicated, and they've been going through a series of restructurings, and people 
uh, uh, haven't taken the time to understand what they're doing. They are moving to the higher margin part of their business, which is the industrial side, de-emphasizing the uh, consumer and the financial side. And again, here's a company that's been growing uh, organically, revenues at about 6 percent, increasing margins so that operating earnings are growing at 8 percent. Plus, you get a 3.5 percent dividend, and they're buying back the stock, uh, disciplined uh, financial management. And mm -hmm. so, uh, the, the, and, and it's selling at a P.E. ratio of about 13 times versus 16 times for the market. So, it's, uh, it's growing operating earnings faster than the S&P, and its P.E. ratio is lower, and its dividend is higher. Okay, let's round it out with uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, CEO Jamie Dimon, back uh, at work after his uh, cancer diagnosis. Tell yeah. us what's going on, um, your outlook for this company. Okay, so the, the wrap on, on, on this company and the industry is that the, the, the government has regulated them so much and constrained them so much as a result of the financial crisis that they're basically no growth and, and just utilities. Yet, if you look at uh, uh, J.P. Morgan, obviously the best management or among the best management in the, in the industry, a fortress balance sheet, loans are starting to grow as the economy improves, legal expenses uh, are declining, and, and again, you're going to have a situation mm -hmm. where margins are going up, and they're, right. they're buying back stock and dividends at the rate of $3 billion a quarter. Jim. It's the real value. Jim, it's great to see you, as always. Thanks for joining Thank us you. tonight. Jim Awad with Plimsoll Mark Capital. Still ahead, lazy, entitled, and living in their parents' basement. That's how some define the millennial generation. But a new study about this demographic and their money, well, it paints a very different picture. We have word tonight that there was another security breach, this time at retailer Kmart. The company says the breach started in early September, and it was detected on October 9th. Its parent company, Sears, says it's working with law enforcement authorities and that its payment systems had been breached by malware. And speaking of malware, another big retailer hacked. Ice-cold cyber thieves have gotten hold of customer names, credit card, debit card info from nearly 400 Dairy Queens of all places. Computers at about a tenth of the ice cream and burger chain's 4,500 locations were infected with malware called Backoff. That's the same software that struck a number of U.S. retailers over the past year. Uh, the queen is owned uh, by the king of investing, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. <laughs> A new study out this week by Fidelity on the money habits of millennials. It found that nearly four in ten do worry about their financial futures at least once a week. And no surprise, considering that many are burdened with student loans. They've seen their parents bear the brunt of the housing downturn and recession. But as Sharon Epperson reports, Fidelity's research has also refuted some common misconceptions about the millennial generation. 23-year-old administrative assistant Christina Audi knows all too well some of the common beliefs about her generation. Pretty familiar with them. We do hear it a lot. They think that we're lazy and entitled. And I definitely don't think that you could say our whole generation is lazy. I'm sure there are people out there. But millennials are much more than the sum of their stereotypes. I do live on my own. I don't feel entitled at all. Um, I pay for my expenses, and I'm not lazy. I'm definitely a hard worker. Millennials, whose numbers now exceed baby boomers, have become a closely examined group. But a new study by Fidelity reveals some discrepancies between their reputation and the realities of how they spend and save. Part of the mystery in defining the money habits of millennials has to do with their age. Millennials can range in age from roughly 19 to 32. From college students and recent grads entering their first jobs to young moms and dads juggling kids' careers, a home, and their own retirement. In Fidelity's first ever millennial money study, the average age is 30. 80 percent of them do not live at home with mom and dad, and they pay all of their expenses. Many are also serious about saving. Nearly half have started to save for retirement. Four in 10 participate in a 401k plan, 
and one in five has an IRA. A significant number of millennials could also be called super savers. We found that there's a population of millennials that are saving 15% or more for retirement. And while many think that they're not interested in retirement, they actually are because they know it's their responsibility. There's not going to be any sort of safety net there for them. Money means security to many millennials. Fidelity found more than two thirds in their study are working. Their average salary is $64,000 and average savings is $37,000. I think saving is very important. I never want to live paycheck to paycheck. I really want to be able to have money in case of any emergencies and just for things that I want, especially as I'm getting older. Like Christina Audi, more than half of the millennials in the Fidelity study said accumulating savings is their top financial goal. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Sharon Epperson. And finally, tonight, some advice you may want to pass along to anyone currently in college or planning to attend. A survey by a Toronto-based staffing company found that engineering and engineering technologies top the list of the best college majors to have for securing a job after graduation. Business majors were next, followed by marketing, health professions, computer in and information sciences, and science technologies. Art history, anyone? You better start getting Mackey in on his science well, and math. Math, baby, math. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garrow. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. And thanks for me as well. You have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you in part by TheStreet.com, featuring Stephanie Link, who shares her investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights with Action Alerts Plus, the multi-million dollar portfolio she manages with Jim Cramer. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. I'm Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. Another day of brutal selling on Wall Street. Not only did the Dow suffer its third triple digit loss of the week, the Nasdaq had a rare triple digit decline. The main culprit was semiconductor stocks after microchip technology warned of a possible correction in the industry, triggering a sell off in a host of chip makers. After another up and down session, stocks sold off into the closing bell. The Dow lost 115 points, going negative for the year. The Nasdaq Tech tumbled 102 points and the S&P down 22. Shares of arcade restaurant chain Dave & Buster's ended higher in their trading debut. And a new survey finds engineering is the best college major to secure a job after graduation. Business and marketing are next. Be sure to tune in to Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.